it is difficult to find someone who hasn't heard the name Titanic or the story of her hitting the iceberg. It was a well-trodden and popular story before the movie, and that film only made it more well-known. But what of her sisters? Olympic, the old reliable workhorse that remained into service in the 1930s. And Britannic, perhaps the most unlucky of the three. Where Titanic had been a confluence of factors, her fate can largely be brought down to recklessness, more so than plain bad luck. As for Britannic, well, there are many ways to look at her sinking, but unlucky is certainly high on the list. Yes, I am aware of the recent Ocean Liner Designs video, it's what prompted me to look at Britannic. Naval YouTubers are a pretty cross-pollinated ecosystem. Now, as is the case with my videos, we must look at Britannic's history before we can talk about her sinking, short as her history may be in the long run. She began life as the third of White Star Line's great trio of superliners. Olympic had been a successful vessel and paved the way for her sisters, demonstrating that White Star's strategy of focusing on luxury over speed was a viable one. Where Cunard's grand liners Lusitania and Mauritania were faster, Olympic was the last word in ocean-going luxury. White Star fully intended to outdo themselves with each of their new liners, though, so Titanic was, in turn, more luxurious than Olympic, and by extension, slightly larger. We all know what happened to her, though, so I won't talk much about Titanic other than how it relates to Britannic. And for her part, Britannic was intended to be a yet further improvement on her elder sisters, refining their design and adding in more luxury features. This plan didn't get very far, though, as Britannic was laid down on November 30th, 1911, as Harland and Wolfe's yard number 433. Construction would proceed at a steady, if not particularly fast rate, until her elder sister sank on her maiden voyage. Ship 433, which was probably never actually named Gigantic, would be delayed as a result. Construction was halted as the Titanic media show went on, and investigations progressed. These investigations would see several changes made to Britannic as she lay on the stocks, resulting in a ship that was fairly substantially modified in comparison to her elder siblings. Most obviously, even when it wasn't really clear how Titanic had actually been damaged, changes were made to her hull. Her beam was increased to fit a new inner skin, which would, in theory, prevent her from suffering the same kind of damage that sank Titanic. If she did suffer similar damage, that inner skin would protect the compartments from the flooding that her sister had dealt with. And if the inner skin was still pierced badly enough to cause that flooding, well, six of her watertight bulkheads were extended up to B-deck. While it probably didn't doom Titanic on its own, the fact that water could just flow over the top of the watertight bulkheads certainly didn't help matters. Britannic was, in turn, designed to avoid that issue. Furthermore, she was changed to, again in theory, remain afloat even if six of those compartments flooded in comparison to the four of Olympic and Titanic. These changes increased Britannic's displacement in beam, which necessitated a more powerful turbine, 18,000 horsepower, being fitted to maintain her speed. The increase in beam from 92 to 94 feet may not seem like much, but that adds up on the scales we're talking about here. All of these changes are obvious if you look at her design, but not really apparent from a visual perspective. The most notable change in that regard was her lifeboats. Where Titanic had already carried more than legally required, there had been nowhere near enough for everyone aboard. Britannic would not have that issue, being designed to carry 48 lifeboats. These were, furthermore, carried in new davits that were electrically powered and could reach lifeboats on either end of the ship. That allowed for using the boats, no matter what sort of lists the ship took on, short of outright capsizing. The capacity of these new lifeboats was something like 3,600 people, which provides a safety net of about 300 over how many Britannic was theoretically capable of carrying in actual service, that being about 3,300. All of these safety features saw her displacement rise to 53,200 tons, with her gross register tonnage rising to 48,158. With all of these design changes out of the way, Britannic was certainly far safer and tougher than her elder sisters. That alone would have been a massive improvement, 
But White Star, still smarting from the loss of Titanic, went a step further in intending Britannic to be a further improvement on luxury, even compared to whatever the initial plans for her had been. This would have seen her interior spaces fitted out in ever more grand and impressive manners. Among other things, the fitting of a pipe organ on her grand staircase. This in addition to such things as extra aft superstructure, to provide a promenade for third-class passengers. Comfort remained the name of the game, and Britannic would have been more comfortable for third class, while also having fancier features for first class as well. The swimming pool clad in marble. A nursery for children. Individual bathrooms for first class staterooms, which would have been a first at the time. All very fancy, all very much improved from the already luxurious Olympic and Titanic. That being said, it is difficult to talk about these changes in great detail, because Britannic would never actually receive most of those internal fittings. You see, while initially projected for entering service in early 1914, the myriad of post-Titanic changes made to Britannic would delay her by quite a bit. She wasn't even launched until February 26th of 1914. This would end up being quite a media event, being as it was filmed and thousands of people gathered to watch. It would also be unfortunate as the Great War kicked off soon after. Understandably, British shipbuilding industries were rapidly geared up and transferred to military use. Britannic, in dry dock for her fitting out, had construction slowed down to a veritable crawl. It didn't quite stop, but it certainly didn't progress quickly either. Ignoring, for the moment, that materials and manpower were being shifted to military needs, the Britannic was an utterly massive ship. In a time of war, it was by no means a given she would even be used in passenger service. While still a ways away, the unfortunate fate of Lusitania makes clear how dangerous that had suddenly become. And at her size, Britannic was hardly fit for armed merchant cruiser duties. Even Olympic, already in service, was converted to troop transport instead. So with no rush to complete her for several reasonable reasons, Britannic languished a bit. Construction continued at a snail's pace until May of 1915. At that point, she was complete insofar as her engines could be trialed at her moorings. Most of her fancy fittings had yet to be installed, though. Nor would they be installed as the British Admiralty came knocking. With many ocean liners being converted to various roles, Britannic, now complete enough to sail under her own power, was no exception. More specifically, she got taken in tow for Winston Churchill's wild ride. That is, the ill-advised and ill-fated Gallipoli campaign. She was by no means unique in this. The similarly new RMS Aquitania would also be dragged in, converted to hospital ship use after initially serving as a troop ship in August of 1915. A few months after that happened, with the bloodbath requiring as many hospital ships as possible, Britannic was pulled in too. On November 13th, Britannic, laid up for all intents and purposes, was requisitioned by the Admiralty. When other fancy fittings had been installed, were stripped out as she was converted to hospital use. Her hull was painted a blinding white with green stripes and red crosses down either flank to make it very clear what she was. Her interior spaces were given over to doctors and nurses, with beds and operating rooms taking the place of common areas. By December 1915, she was fully converted and ready to enter service. Now known as HMHS, His Majesty's Hospital Ship Britannic, she set sail for the sunny Mediterranean. Her maiden voyage began on December 23rd and saw her sail first to Naples, then to the Greek island of Limnos, where she took aboard patients on New Year's Eve. With those patients aboard, Britannic returned to Britain. Quite unlike her elder sister, her maiden voyage was a fairly uneventful one, in spite of the World War raging around her. Britannic arrived in Southampton on January 9th, 1916, without any notable incidents. Her following two voyages would be similarly uneventful, which would seem to make her something of a lucky ship. Her second voyage, beginning on January 20th, saw her return to Naples once again. When she returned to Britain, it would only be for a short time, as her third voyage began on March 20th and ended on April 4th. As the Gallipoli campaign was winding down, Britannic was suddenly surplus to requirements, 
and was transferred back to the White Star Line. She had given good service and saved thousands of lives. And with 75,000 pounds in compensation for their time, along with a good reputation in hand, White Star set about refitting their new Star Liner. This was in June 1916. It is during this process, as her civilian fitting out continued, that Britannic's luck took a turn for the unfortunate. Because, in spite of being returned to White Star as no longer necessary for hospital ship duty, well, the Admiralty came back, hat in hand, and said, we would rather like our ship back, please. Campaigns in the Balkans and the Middle East required doctors and hospital ships, so Britannic was stripped out again, and converted, again, into a hospital ship. White Star, likely quite peeved at this point, really had no choice in the matter. After only a couple months of having her back, Britannic returned back to the Mediterranean in September 1916. This voyage, her fourth, would see her hit by a fairly substantial storm on her way to Naples. It didn't do any real damage, though even on a ship her size, I doubt it was particularly fun for those aboard her. Speaking of uncomfortable things, her fifth voyage would see her quarantined on Limnos due to food poisoning. Fun times. But, in spite of those incidents, she was still living something of a charmed life. No real damage, no real incidents, and she was giving good service. It would be her sixth voyage where all of that came to an abrupt end. That voyage began on November 12th and saw her take the usual route to Naples and then on to Greece. A storm delayed her for a day in Naples, but she still left for Greece more or less on schedule. That was the last good thing about this voyage. For on Tuesday, November 21st, 1916, Britannic shook from a massive explosion. That morning at 8.12 a.m., she had slammed into a mine on her starboard side. She was sailing through Greek waters and just happened to run into a mine laid by a German submarine sometime before. Britannic immediately began to take on water. Her captain, Charles Bartlett, ordered the watertight doors shut and an SOS sent out. Unfortunately, while Britannic could send out messages, the explosion had severed the wires for her receiver. She could shout for help, but not hear what people were responding with. As for the more direct damage, it wasn't immediately fatal. Britannic, remember, had been refit to survive flooding to six of her bow compartments instead of the four of her elder sisters. She was reaching that limit, but that didn't mean she was necessarily doomed. On the ragged edge of what she could survive, with damage flooding six of her compartments, but not at immediate risk of sinking, if she stopped and awaited rescue. This is where the bad luck comes into play. Bad luck, or just plain negligence, you decide. Because the nurses very much against standing orders, mind you, had opened a bunch of portholes to air out the wards. This unauthorized decision had left a bunch of openings for the water to get into Britannic. While the portholes letting in water would not doom the ship in of themselves, the fact that they let water pass the watertight compartments as she slipped further beneath the waves didn't really help, just as what happened with Titanic with water flowing over the top of her doors. Bartlett didn't really make this issue any better by trying to steer Britannic towards an island to beach her. This isn't a bad idea on the face of it, but it served to drive in water faster and increase the rate of her sinking yet further. This also increased the list to the point that, once more against orders, her crew lowered two lifeboats out of a fear the ship would capsize before they could. This would have fatal consequences as Bartlett waited too long to stop the ship. Her propellers, coming out of the water at this point, were still running. Two lifeboats were sucked into them with... Well, I'm sure you can imagine the results. After a further attempt to restart the engines and beach the vessel, Bartlett ordered abandoned ship at 9am, though most of those aboard had already escaped. The captain himself walked out of the bridge and into the water that was already reaching that level, swimming to a lifeboat. The water was so shallow here, and Britannic so long, that when her bow slipped fully beneath the waves, it collided with the seafloor. This tore and twisted her hull, while her stern remained above the waves. That would soon follow the bow, though, 
leaving Britannic the largest ship sunk in the Great War. Out of the 1,066 people aboard, only 30 died. This is, alas, where Britannic's story ends. All that work, all that effort, did make her safer than her sisters. But she would never receive the luxury fittings to turn her into a sailing palace like the world had never seen. She would be taken from her owners twice over, and finally driven into a mine off the coast of Greece. One does wonder what would have happened had those portholes been sealed, and Bartlett stopped the ship after the impact. Might she have survived? It's certainly a possibility. It would have made her life an interesting one had she survived and been put back into White Star service. Quite a bragging rights moment, one imagines. As it is, all that remains of Britannic is her shattered hulk, one of the more intact ocean liner wrecks to this day. Along with the pipe organ that should have been on her grand staircase, which has somehow found its way to a museum in Switzerland. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.